Hello folks, welcome back to our recorded lectures for ML 103. This is an unexpected origin story, King Alfred in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Now, one of the most interesting things about Valhalla's Alfred is that he sort of accidentally winds up as the Grand Magister of the Order of the Ancients in England. He didn't want to inherit the role, but he did. It gets passed down through his family, and he comes to it rather unexpectedly, rather like he came to the throne rather unexpectedly. Uh, in history, he is the youngest son of King Aethelwulf, and three of his brothers reigned before him. This is a sign of how chaotic things were in eh, Wessex at that time in history. We know he grew up in a very religious atmosphere. Uh, Aethelwulf was deeply religious and had wanted a career in the church. His mother was very religious as well. We also know that Alfred was sent to Rome when he was about four years old to be received by the Pope. This might have been some sort of pilgrimage done in his father's stead, but in any case, it was highly unusual. And Anglo-Saxon kings had actually made a habit of going to Rome, but none of them had had such an experience early in their lives like this, as far as we know. We actually do have a surviving letter from the Pope back to Aethelwulf, telling him that he'd received Alfred as his spiritual son and given him various marks of honor. Now, Alfred makes a second pilgrimage some years later, this time with his father. They were gone from England for two years. And upon their return, the eldest brother, who had been ruling in his father's stead, didn't want to relinquish authority. He would think this would, you know, be time for Q civil war, but in fact, that's not what happened. He and his father simply divided the kingdom, and each ruled a half until Aethelwulf died. Now, the eldest brother died about three years later. He was succeeded by the next brother, who ruled for about five years, and died in the same year as the arrival of the great army. He was succeeded by the third brother, Aethelred, and Alfred was his secundarius, which is a Latin term that we think is roughly similar to the Celtic term tanist, which is basically crown prince or next heir in line. It was enough to set him up to eventually succeed his brother. Now, we know a lot about Alfred, and we, there's basically one reason for this, and that reason's name is Asser. Asser was a uh, churchman who served as Alfred's biographer. Uh, Asser's life of Alfred is just a tremendous document. We don't have anything like it from this period. It just gives such a detailed background, not only of Alfred's reign, but also of his childhood, of his personality. Um, Asser actually shows up more than once in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. There are two world events in Winchester that deal with him. Uh, one is, you know, setting him onto the path of serving as Alfred's biographer, and the other is just, you know, kind of jarring him out of his religious fervor. Now, Asser talks about how Alfred was loved best of all of his brothers by his parents, how he was just the cutest. Well, Asser calls him the comeliest, not the cutest, uh, but well, cutest, well-behaved, brightest little boy one could ever imagine. But he was left unable to read until he was 12, or perhaps even older. And Asser blames uh, Alfred's parents and tutors for this, but points out that even in his preliterate state, uh, Alfred was a great lover of English poems and had a very prodigious memory. And this is the period from which we see one of the more famous stories about Alfred that comes from Asser's writing. Uh, specifically, it's an anecdote about his mother and an illuminated book of poetry. She promises to give it to whichever of their sons could learn it the fastest. Now, Alfred, who had been hit with divine inspiration, but also just loved how beautiful the illuminations were, promptly took the book, went to his teacher, and learned how to read it. And Asser kind of uses this as a jumping off point to talk about how fascinated Alfred was with learning and the liberal arts, but how he could never fulfill that craving, because apparently there were no good scholars in the kingdom of Wessex at the time. Is this true? Probably not. It's probably a literary device that's setting up a contrast with all of Alfred's cultural work later. Now, something else that Asser talks about that's really interesting are Alfred's medical issues. He talks about how Alfred was struck by a sudden severe pain after attending a wedding and how mysterious it was to the physicians. 
He provides a few potential explanations. He suggests it could be witchcraft, it could be the devil, it could be a fever that no one really understood or understands, or it could be uh, piles. Piles, by the way, are hemorrhoids. Now, Hester claims that uh, Alfred prayed to God to substitute some less serious illness for whatever it was that he had, as long as it wasn't leprosy or blindness. Uh, but that he suffered from this illness for 25 years. He even gets into how this affected Alfred's psychology. He said that even if the pain stopped, Alfred would be so terrified of it that he felt he was useless for worldly affairs. Asser doesn't feel this way. Asser is clearly just making a distinction that this was Alfred's opinion and that he was being too hard on himself. Now, the interesting thing is that all of this is harmonious with his representation in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. He is not depicted as a warrior at all. And that is perhaps not historically accurate because we know the real Alfred likely fought, uh, especially Ashdown uh, at the very least. But he is depicted in sources about him as somewhat ascetic which is something that carries over to the game's version of Alfred. He kind of always looks like he's a little bit uncomfortable, you know, as someone with chronic hemorrhoids might look. Uh, he is depicted as deeply religious, and this is his primary character trait, his, his true faith in the Christian church. But he is hated by some members of the Order of the Ancients who are unaware of his identity because, you know, he is the person at the top of the pyramid. No one knows him. He knows everybody else. Uh, because he is so deeply religious, he's considered to be soft, especially by some of the high-ranking members of the order who are within his own city of Winchester. He is seen as too Christian. His actual um, faithful belief in Christianity is seen as a weakness. Now, obviously, the game does not fully reflect the complexity of the history leading up to the attack on Chippenham. Certainly, Alfred has some victories in the months beforehand. Uh, he blockades part of the great army in a fortress at Exeter and forces them to return to Mercia. He takes advantage of some bad weather that destroys part of the Danish fleet and leaves the land forces cut off. Now, after the attack on Chippenham, the game follows him out into the refuge that he takes in the marshes uh, in the village of Athelney. Cue the cake scene, which we've already talked about, is a familiar nursery tale amongst British youngsters. Uh, but instead of coming back out of the marshes and rallying the Shire levies and engaging the Vikings at Eddington, he leaves in the game. He leaves England in order to start building his new order. The historical Alfred, of course, fought the Battle of Eddington, came to an agreement with Guthrum, who accepted baptism, and accepted the Danes as settlers on his land. Now, I've mentioned before there may not have actually been a Treaty of Wedmore, but we know that the original agreement between Alfred and Guthrum laid out how boundaries would be defined between the two peoples, how disputes between Danes and Saxons would be handled, uh, as seen in the traditional historiography, Eddington and Wedmore are depicted as the point where the tide turned for England. And this isn't really accurate. This is perhaps the point where the English decided they had to concentrate on making at least some of these people neighbors, which would help settle things down and restore a degree of peace. Now, Alfred would go on to retake London. And uh, we're going to talk more about London at a later lecture uh, next week, I believe, because it's a really interesting case in the Saxon period. We've already talked about how he fortified the birds in order to guard against the next Danish attack, which came in 892. Again, he does not decisively defeat the Vikings or save England. He out-strategizes them. He outlasts them. He finds a way to encourage them to integrate, which again, is very harmonious with his representation in the game. But as I said, this goes far beyond the history as depicted in the game. I do wonder if they're going to revisit it, if we're going to see what happens to Alfred uh, before the second year of DLCs is done. All right, so something else that's important to remember about King Alfred, and which does come through in the game's depiction of him, uh, he's very much a cultural architect. He wants to build 
uh, better people, basically, through education. Scholars sometimes talk about what they call the Alfredian Renaissance, which is a bit of a stretch, but it was definitely a significant cultural program that he launches in the 870s. And there's a real reason to do it. At this time in England, basic literacy is at risk. Uh, in one of the works that he personally translated into English, he writes in his preface that when he came to the throne, there were, as far as he could recall, very few men south of the Humber River and none south of the Thames who could translate a letter from Latin to English or even to comprehend in English the meaning of the Latin services. So you might think, is he just, you know, exercising his exaggeration here? Well, here's the thing. We have charter evidence from Church at Canterbury. Uh, so I've mentioned Canterbury before, sort of the heart of the English church at the time. And we have 52 charters from the 9th century that survive in the archive there. Looking at them, we can actually see tangible evidence of the decay that Alfred was so concerned about. Uh, in the first half of the century, there were numerous scribes at Canterbury. Their calligraphy was tremendously impressive. They were decent Latinists. They were able to make up the charters properly. Charters are basically very formulaic. You have to know the different pieces of a charter, what it has to say in order to be valid. But when you move on into the charters from the second half of the century, you see the decline. Their grammar gets worse. Their spelling is unduly influenced by the vernacular pron pronunciation. Basically, they're becoming very poor writers of Latin because they don't speak it. They barely write and read English, some of them. Now, things get very bad with the appearance of one particular scribe who winds up, we think, is the person in charge at Canterbury uh, in the archive. He's the first scribe that we can identify uh, after the sack of Canterbury by the Vikings in 851. We can assume that because of the raid, uh, the church had to bring in scribes from elsewhere, ones who weren't as well trained. The scribe's last surviving charter comes from 873, around 20 years later. And during that time, he becomes the only scribe active at Canterbury. And he's terrible. The last charter is awful. He didn't have the ability to adapt the formula. So think of it like a permission slip. Um, but he's trying to change the permission slip to say that, you know, your child can go and do something completely different than originally what the permission slip was asking. He's trying to change this from a royal diploma into a charter for an archbishop to sell one of his estates. But what you see when you look at this charter are corrections, are interlined comments by the scribe. He repeats phrases. He omits others. He misrecords the witnesses. So this is 873. This is the Metropolitan Church of Canterbury, the heart of the English Christian Church, and it had to rely entirely on one scribe whose sight was apparently failing so badly that he could no longer see what he'd written. So it's a really vivid testimony to the decline in the quality of uh, literacy in England in this period. It makes Alfred's comment very possible. Now, Alfred's reaction to this, as I said, is a very ambitious cultural program. And this involves translating into English uh, various works of uh, pastoral theology, phil philosophy, and history, uh, translating them into English and making them available for people to read. He does a lot of these translations himself. What he wants to create is a corpus of English works, good English works, morally uh, edifying English works that would be available both at Alfred's court and at Episcopal centers throughout the kingdom. They were meant to be used to teach young nobles and freemen the ability to read English well. And that was a first step. The goal was to create a foundation for a clergy that would be fully literate in Latin. So why did he want so much to have literate subjects. What, what is the big deal with this? Uh, Asser talks about how determined Alfred was to educate his judges. And he uses a similar language to when he discusses Alfred himself uh, seeking what you would call moral or religious literacy, which he calls sapientia, so wisdom in Latin. 
This seems to have mattered to Alfred more than just administrative expertise. There were religious considerations behind Alfred's cultural program as well. He wanted to see his people taught the religious ideas that were important for them to know. His philosophy is that uh, an educated populace was a fortified populace. He's fortifying his people spiritually and morally the same way that he's fortifying the burrs with stone walls. So one of the things he does is he initiates the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, and there should be an L in there, obviously. Uh, it's a history that brings together all the little fragmented historical traditions of the different Saxon groups, focusing on Wessex as sort of the heart of this new emerging nation state, if you want to call it that, which you shouldn't at this time. Uh, this is a key part of his plan. His court school is also a key part of his plan. This is a school where the youngsters of his court, his nobles, even talented children of lesser birth, could be trained as administrators, could be educated in the law, could be trained how to rule. And we actually know that he was quite serious about spreading education, even if we don't know much about the court school, because he actually is recorded as having threatened his nobles with losing all their offices if they didn't learn how to read and teach their kids how to do so. So again, this uh, flinty, determined, deeply devout Alfred is very clearly reflected in the Alfred of Valhalla. I've mentioned before that he's referred to by the designers of the game as the antagonist, not the villain. That's a fine point, but it's an important one. He's Eivor's enemy because Eivor wants to conquer England, but he also respects Eivor's abilities. Uh, it respects them enough to actually enlist Eivor when his own life is threatened by members of the order. He does try to convert Eivor to Christianity afterwards. It's not quite convert or die, but he does make uh, Eivor persona non grata in Winchester when he refuses and Eivor has to flee the city. Now, at the end, when his identity as the Magister of the Order is revealed, uh, he's actually almost kind to Eivor. He says, you know, you've saved England, now you should let England save you. He is really hoping um, to sort of pull Al Eivor over onto his side, in a way. He doesn't want to wipe out all the Danes, just as the Alfred of history was not planning to do that. Getting them to settle on the land to convert to Christianity. Uh, this is perhaps not as desirable as tossing them out of England completely, but it's less costly in the long term. So the game's Alfred seems to understand the same thing that history's Alfred did. War is costly. War is not necessarily the best way to achieve one's goals. Now, there was a lot of online controversy after the first Valhalla trailer, where Alfred appeared to be the villain of the piece, you know, drawing up a declaration of war against the Vikings. And I always thought that was a bit funny, but then again, you know, it is Alfred the Great. You know, he's lionized by popular history. He's the great leader, the great diplomat, the man who saved England. The idea of him as a villain didn't sit well with people. It's interesting that there's been so little reaction to the way he was actually portrayed, because in the end, it was shockingly nuanced. You see all of these recognizable character traits if you're familiar with the Alfred of history. He's logical, he's strategic, he's not frothing at the mouth with hatred for the Danes. But he also does some very ruthless things. You know, he steers Eivor around England like a pawn, he manipulates him, using the disguise of the poor soldier of Christ by sending him intel. But here's the thing. Eivor was capable of getting rid of the order members, and wasn't England better off, both Saxons and Danes, without them? Now, he is responsible for Uba's death at the end of the game, which is a bit of a pity, because Uba is, of course, one of the few Vikings who genuinely wanted to live in peace with the Saxons. But then Uba was still an invader, threatening Alfred's kingdom, and Alfred was justified in attacking him. Now what's really telling is that Eivor and Guthrum as well both admired Alfred despite themselves. You know, he was a match for them. and He was a principled man by his own standards. They both recognized that. Now when Alfred leaves England to go to the continent and begin to found his new order, uh, he gives Eivor a key to his study in Winchester and they can go there and find some interesting documents. There's a set of commentaries by Alfred himself on his situation. And you can read about his anger at the order misusing Christianity as a tool. You know, he says, you know, they're pagans, they're disgusting. 
They're using, they're hiding behind Christianity, using it to solidify their power. Uh, in another paragraph, he actually talks about feeling like he owes the Danes for killing King Ayala, because Ayala otherwise would have inherited the position of magister. Uh, he talks about Charlemagne. He has a copy of Alcuin of York's last letter to Charlemagne, where he tries to convince Charlemagne not to have anything more to do with the order. Uh, he is horrified that Charlemagne was uh, corrupted by them. Now, what's really interesting is that Alfred, in his commentaries, talks about his desire to provide guidance to people that would allow them to harmonize themselves with the order of the universe, to think safe and sober thoughts that are aligned with nature. And the wording of his pledge echoes a much later Templar master's discussion of the Templar order's philosophy. So this is sort of an Easter egg for longtime Assassin's Creed fans, like so much else in Valhalla. So I would have to say, as somebody who has taught King Alfred's life and King Alfred's work probably more times than she can count at this point, I found the game's depiction of Alfred just absolutely fascinating and remarkably authentic. You know, it really did, up until the moment where he leaves to found the Templar Order, it really did fit seamlessly into the Alfred that we know from history. Uh, as I said, I just get the sense that the story's not done. Um, it's looking like at least one of the uh, DLC in the second year is going to be mythologically focused, uh, which is fair. So everybody wants to see more of Ragnarok, right? But I really hope that they do something with King Alfred. I just, I really want to see the end of his story. I want to see what happens um, to Eivor. How does Eivor wind up dying in Vinland? Why is their grave there? Why aren't they back home at Ravensthorpe? Did Alfred come back and drive them out? I guess we will see if we get any answers to those questions. All right, so that will do us for this week. Uh, thanks very much, guys. I look forward to seeing you uh, on Wednesday. Good luck with uh, your work on your questline assignment.